Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord, and I am delighted to be your host. I am a stand-up comedian, author, Center for Inquiry fellow, and fellow Earth dweller for the time being. Uh, we all know that March is Women's Month, but it is also Rescue Cat Awareness Month, or as my cat calls it, Rescue Human Awareness Month. Uh, I think we can all agree that they and the dogs are doing the best they can. If fur is not your thing, then might I point out that it is also Dolphin Awareness Month. In fact, a study found that dolphins have similar personality traits to humans. Sadly, the dolphins read the study and are now suing for defamation of character. I need a rim shot sound effect for this. <laughs> now, as we get all settled in, uh, I have a couple of quick reminders. CFI's podcast, Point of Inquiry, is available wherever you get your podcasts. And if you haven't already, get yourself a subscription to this bad boy here, Skeptical Inquirer Magazine, which is super easy to do just by going to skepticalinquirer.org. Also, if you have any questions for our guest, and I'm sure you will, please type them into the Q&A box and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. I mean... Why wouldn't you? We've got a rock star here. Because, um, yes, tonight we are joined by, like, I feel one of the rock stars of science, Dr. Stephen Novella. He has co-authored the, hold on, Skeptic's Guide to the Future. Uh, so that means today we are talking about tomorrow. El futuro, la vanir, ya yayo. Uh, the good doctor will talk about what we can learn from past futurists to help us more meaningfully imagine the future of science and technology and what kinds of technological innovations are likely in the next 20, 100, or even 1,000 years. Now, my expectations for the future are quite modest. I'm hoping they finally invent a camera that instead of adding 10 pounds, takes them away. We'll hear about what futurists in the past got right and what they got wrong, how technology will continue to profoundly change our world and redefine what it means to be human. And so our guest is the host and producer of the award-winning weekly science podcast, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. I think it's awesome that Bill Nye, the science guy, refers to this uh, group as, a, a, as that it was a knowledgeable, knowledgeable, uh, a knowledgeable nerds. Our guest perhaps then is the king of the nerds and is an internationally known author of three books on science and critical thinking and a popular science communicator with multiple TV appearances. He also authors uh, the popular and award-winning neurological blog and is the senior editor of the website Science-Based Medicine. Now I've had the pleasure of working with him uh, when I emceed at Nexus, the Northeast Conference on Science and Skepticism. And I hope to get to see him in person this year in Atlanta at DragonCon. So this is a real treat for me and will be for you too. Uh, please welcome to the Skeptical Inquirer Presents Screen, Dr. Stephen Novella. Doctor, sir. Thank you, Leanne. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Um, my pleasure. Good to see you too. Please take it away, but know that I am here. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks again. And thanks to CSI for you know, inviting me to, to to do this. I always like talking about uh, the future, technology, etc. So here's the book, The Skeptic's Guide to the Future. Um, a lot of people ask me, how long did it take you to write the book? I said, well, you know, if you include the background research, it took about 40 years, because that's, I feel that's how long I've been researching this book. Uh, along with my co-authors, my brothers, Bob and Jay, we have been reading about, talking about, doing deep investigations of of the of predicting the future, futurism, technology, where is it going uh, for our entire adult lives. And of course, you know, we, we are able to talk about it at, at length on our podcast uh, I remember when I went to them with this idea for our next book after, you know, the Skeptic's Guide to the to the Universe book, 
And I said, this is a book the three of us need to write together. They immediately agreed. And it was one of those ideas. The book didn't write itself, but the idea kind of wrote itself. Like once we had the idea for this book, we laid out the ch- we laid out the you know basically the entire book in one evening. You know we we met for an hour or so, and we had the outline of the book. It was it was uh, pretty much as it is now with a few t- few tweaks as we wrote it. So what do we cover in the book? You know the first part of it is really about futurism itself. How do we think about the future? How do we predict the future? Can you even predict the future? How have past futurists done? Um, And more importantly, can we learn from that? Can we maybe identify what, uh, what they got right, what they got wrong, what mistakes did they make? And it, can we use that to to do maybe a slightly better job, or at least not fall for the obvious pitfalls that our predecessors did? So we we developed what we call the uh, futurism fallacies, right? Futurism fallacies. These are common things that past futurists did. Not just what, not just the predictions that they got wrong, but the way they got it wrong. What is the kind of mistake that they made? So, for example. Um, you know, past futurists often projected their own culture into the future because I, and I think that psychologically the, there's a, there's a good reason for this one. It's always like a lack of imagination. They didn't think to vary those variables, but also when we think about the future, I do think we like to imagine ourselves in the future. That's the fun part of it, right? We want to imagine ourselves in the future. What would we do if we had a flying car and a jetpack, you know, or whatever? Um, And so that, I think, leads to this tendency to just assume that our current culture will exist in the future. There's a TV show out now called Hello Tomorrow. I love the vibe of the show. And it's explicitly, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's explicitly... You know, you have 1950s culture projected even further into the future than where we are now. So they have technology that's futuristic from our perspective, but it's all retro. So it's retro futuristic is the is the genre. Uh, but it, but it's 1950s culture, you know, in the future. If you watch the movie Forbidden Planet, uh, great movie for its time. I still, you know, kind of a, a classic science fiction movie. But you ha- it takes place in the in this 20. 20- second century i believe 22nd 23rd century humans are using interstellar flight to explore the worlds and the crew of this super advanced interstellar spaceship could have come right off of a world war ii destroyer i mean it was literally transplanted characters from the 1940s into this movie uh so that the beyond the aesthetic beyond just the the dress and the lingo that biases how we think of the future as well. So we we not only project the superficial cultural aspects of ourselves into the future, we also project the our priorities into the future. What we think is important, we assume humans of the future are going to think are important. And just think about previous generations. Think about people from previous centuries as much as we you know can know from history about what that that may have been like uh and you and you know it's, you quickly realize that yeah it was pretty different you know back then um in terms of their relationship with technology and what was important to them so another good example of this is um the you know there it that constrained their thinking about how we will use technology in the future Right. So again, it's not just the culture. It's also about our relationship with the technology. So if you look at futurists from, <clears throat> say, the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, now we're sort of the Industrial Revolution is hitting its peak. You know, it's really hitting its stride at this time. And a lot of the innovations that were that were coming out were essentially you know, the biggest innovations, the ones that were having the greatest impact impact on human civilization, on human culture were those that of convenience, right? So, I mean, I have read some historians argue that the washing machine had a greater impact on human civilization than any other invention because, you know, people went from having to spend 
hours and hours a day and days and a week, you know, just organizing their work schedule around the drudgery of washing clothes. And the, 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 the clothes washer, you know, relieve them of that, you know, refrigeration and, you know, and the dishwasher. So a lot of the, you know, and cooking aids, a lot of, a lot of drudgery, you know, was taken off of, of collectively off of our shoulders. And it really had a massive impact on society. And so the futurists of the time imagined that all future technology would also be about convenience and that convenience would always be the number one priority. And so when they imagine the 1950s or the 1980s or 2000, their future, they always assumed that we would be using technology to make our lives easier, that we would do things through technology and, and with, and that was the number one priority. Um, so like we would be, you know, um, having defrosting frozen food and heating it up at, for like automatic dinners. Now, of course we do do that. You know, we, most of us probably have heated up TV dinners in the microwave, but that's not, a, for most of us, that's not our day to day. You know, we don't, we don't prioritize that as the number one, most important thing is how quickly and how easily we could make food. There's a lot, we have lots of other priorities that might include the quality of the food itself. In fact, some people take pleasure in elaborate, you know, processes of cooking because of that extra quality, you know, that, that handmade uh, benefit that you get from that um, or environmental uh, concerns for, you don't want to be wasteful, you know, for example, you know, it's nice to have everything prepackaged in plastic, but we're getting a little concerned about all the plastic that, that, you know, ends up getting into the waste stream or, um, there might be aesthetic values. Maybe we might choose something because it, it's more fashionable rather than more than more convenient. I think that was probably the demise of the fanny pack. You know, is that very convenient? You know, accoutrement. But you know, I think most people choose not to wear it uh, because of the way it looks, not because of its utility. Uh, so utility is not everything. And also, we don't use the latest technology to do things just because we can. There was, you know, we discussed in the book. There was one really humorous uh, futurist video again produced in the 1960s about the 1990s and you know the the husband of the household was video phoning his wife in the next room she's literally in the next room and he's communicating to her through a video phone uh, speaking of video phones that's always a, a, one of our chief examples again of how of, of um uh, futurism fallacies, how difficult it is to predict often how people use technology. In the 1980s, if you watched science fiction in the 1980s, it was pretty much a given assumption without exception that people in the future would be communicating with video phones. Because why wouldn't we, right? That's the next step. You know, we, 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 you go from phones to video phones. That's the next thing. And, and again, futurists always assume that the future, whenever that is, that undefined time period that takes place indefinitely in the future is always characterized by whatever the next technological development is in any technology. So in communication, we had to go from purely audio to video. Now, interestingly, once you know the technology existed so, so that people could uh, pretty much routinely video phone people, we, we went to texting. We went like in the opposite direction. We went backwards. We didn't go from from writing to audio to video, we went from writing to audio back to writing. Um, no futurist that I'm aware of and no science fiction, you know, we really predicted the dominance of that and the, the unwillingness of people in day-to-day -day life to use video phones. Uh, because again, there's, we think we do things in the highest tech way. We do things that are the most convenient. Uh, and that's it. We don't think about things like, well, texting people allows you to communicate to them in virtual time. You don't have to wait for them to answer the phone. You don't have to talk to them. You may not want to talk to them. Um, if they're busy, you get a busy signal. This way, you just send off your message into the ether and you and you could forget it. You've done it. You did. You achieved your communication. And why don't people want a video phone? Well, it takes a lot of mental effort to be on video. Audio is much easier. You could do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about how you look. It's just a lot less socially energetic to communicate by audio than by video and by text rather than audio. And so it turns out people prioritized social ease, you know, rather than high tech or other features. And again, 
very hard time predicting that. So there's a lot more too. We go over many, many different um, futurism fallacies and try to build a case for, you know, taking a thoughtful approach to futurism. There's some academic research as well into futurism and, and how people try to wrap their mind around it that we get into. Um, but that's really setting the stage for them. Okay, okay, now we're going to do some futurism. We're going to we're going to take our our crack at trying to imagine what the future might be like. But we we tried to do one big thing a little bit differently. We don't actually predict the future per se. I mean, clearly we do. We're extrapolating into the future. But what we're trying to do in the book, rather than saying, we think this is what the future is going to be like, or this is going to happen, or that's going to happen, which a lot of past futurists, as, past futurists did, we just said, here are possible futures. Given the choices that people make, right? Because we really craft our future through the choices that we collectively make. And also sometimes individual people have an outsized role on the future course of technology. If you're in the right place at the right time with the right trillion dollars, right? You can have a huge uh, huge impact on, on future of technology. Um, so we say, you know, people collectively might make this type of choice or that type of choice. And these are the, this is the potential, the, the future potential of various technologies. Or we might say this technology would have this utility, you know, if we chose to use it or prioritize it. And many times we'll, we will say things such as, well, here is a utopian version of this technology. And now here's a dystopian version of this technology. So if we use it to benefit humankind, here are all the potential benefits. And if this technology gets abused, here's all the horrible things that people can do with it. Uh, and of course, we we're living through that today with a lot of the technology that surrounds us. You know, the internet is, is fantastic. Social media we're expl we're exploiting that right now. We're using social media in order to communicate, to consume information, to have a community. Uh, it's fantastic, and yet it's you know arguably destroying democracy. And nobody anticipated that you know they would have this little unanticipated consequence of radicalizing huge portions of the public simply because of computer algorithms that put information in front of you. Um, well, we try to at least think, do a thought experiment about what, what are the ways in which these unintended consequences might happen. And all you have to do really is just imagine what if this technology got in the hands of the worst authoritarian government on earth today? What would they do with it? And that's a good starting point for imagining how, you know, technology that we develop for um, for the good of humanity to, to move the things forward could could end up biting us, you know, in the behind and being used. Uh, to oppress people and to or or whatever, um, so the book transitions into talking about different types of technology. Where and we and we the, the overall formula that we follow, that we try to break out of it, you know, enough at least enough to make the editors happy. But the the formula that we that we generally followed was let's talk about the history of this technology. Where is it today? And then use that arc of the technology. Say, can we project this arc a little bit into the future? And then we say, and then let's go crazy and think about the ultimate potential of this technology. And you could just take any technology and play this game, and it's a lot of fun. So we we did it with things like, well, let's talk about stem cells. Where are we with that? What could this do? If the full potential of stem cells is realized, what would that look like? What, what kind of impact would that have on our world? We could grow organs. How much life extension would we get out of that? What would be the limits of the life extension we can get out of the ability to grow, regrow our organs? Could we regrow an entire body, uh, for example? Of course, you can't mess with the brain because the brain basically is you. So that becomes an inherent limiting factor. But could you use stem cells to extend the longevity of the brain without changing who you are fundamentally or losing your identity? We explore those issues. What if we interface the brain with computers? We explore that technology, the brain machine interface. We're, that's a fun one to talk about because we're kind of right on the cusp of that really taking off. We we have applications. We're doing it now. We did. We know that it works. We've done, we, it works well enough 
that we can do research asking some fundamental questions like just proof of concept kind of things. Can people learn to control computers that are you know, interfacing with their brain? Yeah, turns out they can. Can information from machines be made to feel as if they are natural, like part of your body? Turns out you can, that that all works as well. Can we be made to feel as if these machines are part of us and that we are embodied within them? It turns out, yeah, you that, that works as well. So a lot of the, the proof of concept has been laid down. So now we could say, okay, well, given all of that, how far are we from the matrix? You know, is that even plausible? Will we ever get to something like the matrix? What could that look like? How many, you know, what would that look like physically? And what would be the applications, uh, et cetera? Um, and then we move to, you know, some, you know, more, um, you know, less biological technology to things, even things like just energy. Where are we getting our energy from? And we try to pull all the way back. Like with each technology, we try to start pulled back as far as we could go and just talk about the relationship of energy to human technology, to human civilization. How has it altered throughout the course of human civilization? What role has it played? You know, you, one might argue that the ability to harness energy might be the ultimate limiting factor of the power of a civilization. We talk about the Kardashev levels, you know, where, you know, there is a system for um, characterizing how advanced civilizations are based entirely on how much energy they have at their command. The energy of an entire planet, entire solar system, entire galaxy, et cetera. Uh, human civilization right now is around a 0.7. So we're not even up to one yet, but uh, but we're getting there. And then just, you know, how do you get energy out of stuff? And what are the ultimate sources of energy? And what's the ultimate potential sources of energy? Uh, this leads to, you know, we, we, after talking about existing technology that maybe we could extrapolate into the future, then we get to, all right, let's talk about some technologies that aren't here yet. Uh, so this is not existing technology. This is technology that may be coming around the corner. And are we ever going to get there? How long is it going to take for us to get there? What are things going to be like when we do get there? So staying on the theme of energy, of course, we talk about fusion energy. We don't have it now. Um, and the question is, will it ever work? And if we ever do cross that threshold of practical fusion energy, what will that mean? What will that mean for the world, for humanity? What are all the applications you know, and we explore various possibilities. Maybe we won't even develop it because other forms of energy will be some become so cheap and ubiquitous, like solar panels, et cetera, that it's like, well, what's the point? We already have all the solar energy we need. Um, but then say, yeah, but if we want to settle Mars or or even beyond that, the sun power gets really progressively weak the farther away you get from it. So maybe we might need it there. Or, oh yeah, that's right. We do want to power our spaceships as well. And fusion energy is much better than chemical energy and well fission energy is and fusion energy is even better than than fission energy so you know developing fusion power even if it's not a mainstay of grid of, of the power grids here on earth probably going to be really good power sources for for off-world space stations or settlements on 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 worlds like the moon mars or or, or farther out and it's also probably going to be, if we develop it, and we talk about how close are we, what's the potential, what are the different you know, ways that it's being researched, what would a fusion engine in a spaceship be like? And what's interesting about fusion is that it even it's it's it is this perfect future technology, right? Because it seems very futuristic, but it seems right around the corner. But of course, that's been the case for the last 50 years. Again, the joke is it's 30 years away and always will be. And of course, right now, scientists are telling, yeah, it's about 30 years away, although we really mean it this time. So we'll see. Right. But it's 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 fun to speculate about if, you know, are we really maybe finally getting closer to some actual application of fusion? And if we do, how would we use it? If it, And what's interesting is. That when we do, and I think we'll eventually, I don't, the question with fusion, I don't think is, is if, it's when. Is it going to be this century? Is it going to be next century? Is it going to be later than that? But once we achieve fusion, 
it's going to be one of our primary energy sources pretty much forever. I think for as long as there is human civilization, you have to get to crazy ad advanced technology uh, before fusion would cease to be relevant. Um, and as uh, a power source for a spaceship, it's going to be the best we can do pretty much forever. Uh, there's again, you have to get to the point where you're able to wrangle a black hole and use that as an energy source before you get to something that's actually better than fusion, um, at, at least for internally powered spaceships. I also think that externally propelled spaceships are going to be massive in space travel, uh, such as solar sails. If we could really get that technology to work well, light sails, solar sails. That's going to be a major method of of, of space travel. Um, it, so, you know, if I had to guess, I would say the future of space travel is going to be mostly fusion and and light sails, with chemical rockets just being used to get us off of gravity wells, because that chemical rockets still have one advantage over everything else, and that's their their thrust. They have a lot of thrust. They're great for blasting off the surface of the Earth. And then they suck for everything else. Um, so what would, if we try to say, oh, in 2500, what would our, what's, what's our space uh, program going to look like? What's it going to look like in terms of humans zipping around the solar system? Are we going to be doing it at all? Are we going to be, you know, settling other worlds? If we do, how are we going to get, get around? What, what kind of infrastructure, space travel infrastructure are we going to have? And is it even plausible that we could ever travel interstellar distances? Uh, interstellar distances are really challenging. Uh, and it's, again, it's a good, uh, a good representative technology because we could ask a lot of questions such as not only what are just the potential theoretical technologies that we could use, but what are the challenges? What are the problems that we haven't solved? And it's never a good thing to assume that yeah, we'll just figure that out. Like that, whatever that big problem is, we'll yeah, when once we solve that, then this is what's going to happen. But of course, we don't always we don't always solve those problems. So, like for interstellar travel, um, there's a couple of really big problems. This is where we start to talk about science fiction because like, you know, for technologies that we are so far away, you know, the the um yes, we can do thought experiments about the technology itself, but it's it, it becomes more important and very interesting to think about science fiction, you know, science fiction writers who have tried to imagine the future in detail and what kind of scenarios did they come up with. What's interesting about space travel is that I don't think there's a single science fiction uh, uh, work that I'm aware of. I'm sure there probably is somewhere, but I mean, none, certainly none of the big ones, right? None of the big franchises, one of the mo most popular, you know, science fiction authors or, or, or stories that I'm aware of where they present anything even remotely close to what's going to be the, the case, what we know to be the case. You have to give them massive retconning and gimmies in order to say that it works, but they never really address the real hurdles of interstellar space travel, even shows that try to be as hard science fiction as they can be like The Expanse, which I loved. And there was a lot about it that was, I think, very thoughtful and very true to physics and reality. They had to throw in, man, a couple of gimmies that you just can't make a future, a show about the future of space travel work without these gimmies. So one is radiation. Radiation is a massive problem and we don't know what the answer is. There's solar radiation, which is unpredictable, but we can shield against it. And then there's interstellar, like cosmic rays, which is more steady and predictable. But we have no idea right now, no idea how we are going to shield against it. You could put a few inches of lead around your ship, and that will just make the situation worse. It'll literally make it worse because the, the cosmic rays are so energetic they'll get into the ship and then bounce around and kill every cell in your body eventually. So the, we, I remember we, we asked a representative from NASA at one of our previous uh, events, 
So what's NASA's plans to deal with the whole radiation issue? Like, where are they at with that? And their answer was get there fast. Just don't spend a lot of time in space. Right now, that's the only answer we have. And it's one of those problems where like, you don't even know what the theoretical solution would be. It'd have to be some really advanced metamaterial, I, I think would be, again, if I had to guess what that is, I don't know. But if I had to guess, if we have to come up with some kind of crazy metamaterial that really can block out cosmic rays, either that or you need to come up with re a way to, to, to you know, uh, energy efficiently generate really powerful magnetic fields in order to, or some combination of those two things. Right now, that's our best guess but we don't really have an easy solution. So that may be the kind of thing, again, you never say never, but it might be the kind of thing where that keeps us from, from doing spending a long time in space for thousands of years. Like it might take us a really long time to solve that problem. It's not going to be the kind of thing that we're going to be solving in the next decade, the next half of this century. It's going to be, you have to start to talk in terms of centuries in terms of really solving this problem. The other one is that, you know, space is not empty. It's not just the cosmic rays. There's dust and hydrogen. There's all kinds of stuff there. If we want to get to even the closest star, we got to go really fast. And when you start to go that fast, even a tiny speck of dust will destroy your ship. And so you, you really can't travel at interstellar speeds, um, especially if you have people on board. Uh, unless you are clearing out a path, right? You can't just fly through through space. You have to make space lanes. You need to get like powerful, like super crazy powerful lasers and burn your way through space and make a path, clear a path for you to get through. Uh, that's a huge problem too. So again, what's the answer? You know, there really isn't, I have never even read a proposed viable solution just at, at word, most, like you have to just ignore it or you invent like crazy future technology that might as well be magic. But there's no, there's no extrapolation of our currently known physics and our current technology or what we are thinking about as a potential technology that really solves these problems. Um, and you just never read about them in science fiction because it would be boring, right? Because our heroes have to be able to get around and zip around the galaxies. So we have to kind of just ignore physics and the reality. Uh, but when you're predicting the future, you can't do that, right? You have to say, hmm, what about this? Because uh, if you don't, you end up doing things like investing in a hydrogen infrastructure in 2000, you know, in the 2000 aughts, thinking that, oh yeah, that whole storage problem, we'll sort that out. No worries. Uh, of course, it never happened. Um, one of the one of the most, um, I think, prominent examples of a failure to predict even immediate future technology. You had few, you know, for talking about cars now, hydrogen is great for a lot of applications. It's great if you're not moving around. But if you have to drive around with a bunch of hydrogen as your fuel source, you have a couple of choices. You could cool it down to liquid hydrogen, or you can compress it as a gas, or you have to find something that binds it like a ceramic or something that can bind up and then release it. And so the thinking back in the early 2000s was, yeah, hydrogen is great, man. This is going to be it, you know. Uh, and so we're going to have, here comes the coming hydrogen economy. So let's go all in on hydrogen. And it failed because it failed because they never figured out how to store it well. The best you could do is compressed tanks, air tanks right now um, in terms of cars. For other applications, they're thinking of liquid hydrogen. Actually, you know, liquid hydrogen is going to be the best we could do in terms of energy density, the best we could do, really. And it's still only about half as dense as gasoline. So it's just not a great fuel. It turns out it's just not great. And the the turnaround time and the turnaround efficiency is also not that great. And battery electric cars just kicked its ass. You know, it just got there faster um, and better. And now I think it's too late. You know, hydrogen, I don't think it's ever going to be the fuel for our automobile fleet. It will always have a niche application in transportation. There may be specific applications like trains, maybe airplanes where it serves a role, but it's, I don't think we're going to have a fleet of hydrogen fuel cell cars. The hydrogen economy, I don't think is coming. Um, I think battery technology just got, got too good too fast, and now it's too late. Again, it, people, you know, a lot of people, in industry experts, 
failed to make this prediction right on the cusp of of it being wrong. You know what I mean? Like they were only they were wrong only five to ten years ahead of time. It wasn't like they were projecting far in the future. They were projecting the next thing, and they failed. Um, it's always humbling uh, about that. Um, all right, so uh, the after we we talk about current technology, where that's heading. We talk about technology that's about to come. Uh, and some we say probably will come, but we don't know when. Some we say probably will never come. The the one thing, and often we, we get asked this question, is there anything that about which we changed our minds from the research we did for the book? And I think the big one was the space elevator. Uh, we we were all like we love the idea of a space elevator you have a big cable connected to the ground to a geostationary satellite and then or platform and then you ride elevators up and down the cable and you cheaply get in in access to space without having to burn fuel uh and it's great right looks great on paper and then again it was like all we got to do is figure out what to make the cable out of and once we do that this will be awesome. We'll have, you know, really easy access to space. And it's whenever you hear those words, those little words, all we got to do is solve this one little problem. Uh, unfortunately, those one little problems often turn into deal killers. And again, that's another bit of the, the art of predicting the future or imagining the future is knowing when a hurdle, a problem is a deal killer versus something that we'll eventually figure out. Um, for the space elevator, I think it's a deal killer. I don't really ever foresee a future where we are going to have a space elevator to get off of the earth. It's too many, too many problems. And it's ultimately when you run the numbers, it's just not worth it. Um, Mars, maybe the, the physics works a lot better on Mars. Um, the moon is interesting. The moon's tidally locked to the earth. So it really wouldn't work the same way, but you might have a cable that you could ride down to the earth, you know, for example, but there might be a Mars space elevator one day, but I really, really just don't think we're ever going to have ever. And I mean, ever going to have an earth space elevator, just even no matter how you slice it, it's too vulnerable and probably never going to be worth it. Uh, so once we're done with the about to come technology, maybe yes, maybe no, we go to the really advanced technology. This is where we are just purely speculating now. And this, we take our inspiration from science fiction. The last part of the book is basically about science fiction technology. Like, are we ever going to get transporters and shields and, you know, all the, all that kind of stuff, the really, and lightsabers, is, is it even make any sense? This is mainly an exploration of plausibility. Like, are these sci-fi technologies plausible? You, There's like no hope of trying to predict when they would occur, except to say, yeah, a long time in the future, if at all. Uh, it was more of just a discussion of what would be necessary. What would have to happen for a lightsaber to exist? And does it even make sense? And what would it look like? Um, another aspect of that is when you, uh, of that part of the book, which I found to be a lot of fun, and the lightsaber reminded me of it because I think it's a classic example of this is, you know, first you say, all right, we're, we're starting here with the technology, like, right. You know, technology doesn't always work that way. Uh, oftentimes we start with the basic science discoveries, right. What we could do. And then we find applications for them. Other times there's a really important application and we figure out how to make it happen. Uh, and both things happen, right? They, they, in fact, everything happens. People, there's no one pattern by which technology advances. It advances in everything you, way you could you could imagine. So, um, with but but in this chapter, we're reverse engineering because we're starting with the sci-fi technology, and then we're saying, can we reverse engineer this? Can we find some way to have a lightsaber? What's interesting is that when you figure out what it would take to make that technology happen, you very quickly realize, especially if you explicitly are thinking about it, right? You realize that, well, like for example, with the lightsaber, if in order to have a lightsaber, you need an incredible source of power, a compact 
source of power that's not going to melt the user, right? And the thing is, if you had that, if you had that tech, if you had the necessary technology to have a lightsaber, the applications of that would be massive and a lightsaber would probably be the last thing you would do with it. If you had that much power in the palm of your hand, just making a kill stick out of it would be nice if you're a Jedi. But if in reality, is that really on your short list of what you were going to do with that portable power source that you could probably run a city off of? And that's what it, that's the kind of power that we're talking about in the palm of your hand. So the, often science fiction doesn't close that loop, right? They don't say, yeah, but if, if we had this technology, what would be all the implications of that for society? If Iron Man really had that power source, could he really ethically just use it to power his suit? You know, wouldn't that just change the world if he really had that, really had that power? Or like this, the Enterprise, uh, I'll end my didactic part of the talk with the Star Trek reference, just because Leanne and I are, are both sci uh, Star Trek nerds. If you really had a holodeck, as described in Star Trek, right? And so it, I don't think it started this way. I think they said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if they had, you know, a place they can go where stuff could happen, you know, where you could have holograms. And then they had to sort of retcon and retcon the technology to make it make sense as the franchise evolved until, you know, we have sort of a mature concept of like, yeah, the the um, the holodeck is actually creating using transporter technology to make matter and using all whatever, all these different components of technology in order to create an artificial, you know, uh, uh, but completely seamless a lifelike simulation of reality. And again, if you play that game, it's like, okay, if that were true, if they had that technology, would they really be using it for a holodeck? Would that be the number one thing they, couldn't they have the entire interior of the ship be one giant holodeck? That was, couldn't you have program, oh, completely programmable living and workspaces why would you live in anything else if you live in an environment that you could completely program at at will? Wouldn't that be the ultimate goal to have smart matter or some combination of technologies that would give you the ability to live in a totally programmable environment and not just use it? You know, you would be you know have old school technology everywhere else, but this incredible technology just for your your entertainment just for your unwinding uh after after you do your job um probably not would be my guess i think again the implications of holodeck technology would have transformed civilization in ways that star trek never really explores they wanted a holodeck but to get there they would have had to change the the impact of technology on the rest of society and so that's, you know, again, when you try to like really go far in the future and really go down the rabbit hole of what would this technology mean? You can't think about a single application. You can't even think about a single technology. You have to think about how technology, different technologies interact with each other. You know, what would it mean if we had these suites of technology all advancing at the same time? One might eclipse another or two together might have this synergistic effect that just is mind blowing, you know, like what happens when we combine nanotechnology and artificial intelligence, for example, or what happens when we, you know, combine, you know, robotics with programmable matter or whatever, um, you end up with, you know, interactions of technology that can, you know, produce effects that you can't imagine if you're thinking about technology in isolation. Um, so, at the end of the day, this is all speculation, right? But it's a lot of fun. You know, the 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 goal in writing the book was that if you read the book, you'll learn a lot about current technology, right? That was kind of the primary goal, not only to learn about futurism and how technology has changed our world and how it how it how we use technology and how it progresses into the future, but where did we get our current technology from? How did we get to where we are now? Where we are now wasn't inevitable. Like if you went back in time 100 years, you couldn't predict today based upon what you knew 100 years ago because there were so many things that 
were quirky and and were different choices that were made. You know, we could have been living in a very different technological world right now uh, if things had gone plausibly differently. You know, but the same same token, you know, you, you can't you know accurately predict the details of future technology. But you you know, the more broad brushstroke you get, the more the more high probability you can get. We can sort of imagine these broad brushstrokes of where technology would go. And it's just a lot of fun to not only learn about technology itself, progress itself, you know, how these things interact, but then to imagine what the future will be like. But I'll, I'll leave you with one final thought. Again, our tend- I'll, be, I'll end where I began. When you do that, you're going to be tempted to imagine yourself in that future, but that's not going to probably not what's going to happen. There aren't going to be people like us living in the future. There will be future people who will be different from us. They will have different ideas, different priorities, different cultures, and they will have a different relationship with technology. And that's probably the hardest thing to predict, you know, is how people will change into the future. And because those, it's the choices that those people will make that will determine the even further uh, future technology. And so you get these, you know, increasingly increasing difficulty of trying to go multiple, multiple steps, steps forward, but it's a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed me ranting about this for 45 minutes. You know, we could, I could talk about this obviously for a lot longer. I wanted to leave 15 minutes for questions. This is often the the most fun part of this. Hit me with your questions. Well, what, what kind of crazy stuff you want to talk about? Oh my goodness. Um, that was amazing. <laughs> you were not ranting at all. That was that was wonderful stuff. Um, I, I I will say my ears perked up in 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 several places. I I never heard a lightsaber called a kill stick, but I you know that I guess because I'm I'm hanging out in the Star Trek world versus yeah. the Star Wars world. Um, I I will say though, like you posed a really good question. You know, if you have that portable power source, would you make a lightsaber? And I think, yes, because human beings have proven themselves to like war and yeah. they like to destroy better than they like to build. So, yes, lightsabers for everybody. Yeah, but would they <laughs> only make a lightsaber? That's really the question. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, oh, right? gosh. I mean, no. You would, it would be ubiquitous, right? You would be, I mean, think about how, how useful that would be, even if it was a tenth as powerful. I mean, they, it would just be transformative. Indeed, indeed, and and much better than the lightsaber I brought at Dragon Con last year. Yeah. Um, the, <laughs> you mentioned, um, and this blew my mind because you don't even think about this again. Science fiction fan, not science necessarily. I mean, yes, a fan, but not as well versed. When you talked about the space dust, like if you're going that fast, it'll destroy your ship. So we we need a space swiffer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm hearing. We need a we need a space Dyson. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, we need some way to clear out the space in front of the ship. So you actually, and some, some science fiction, you know, stories make mention of this without ever really exploring it. We might actually need space lanes, you know, like you can't go yeah. anywhere you want to go. You have to chart your path through cleared out planes through space, through interstellar space. Otherwise you're probably not going to get to your destination in one piece and just think about the technology, the, the infrastructure, the energy that would be necessary to do that. We would have to fire up lasers that are hundreds of times, orders of magnitude more powerful than we could create now and and burn our way through space. You know, that's that's what it's something like that. It's, you know, unless somebody comes up with some other solution, but they're like just just plowing through space at high speeds isn't going to work. Right. Well, this is where the uh, lightsaber at Al, I guess, would come in. <laughs> And I love that that it seems like a simple question, but I'm not sure people ask it a lot. The the utopian versus dystopian view, and just in the 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 50 minutes I've had to think about it, um, the washing machine holds up. Yeah. No evil use for the washing machine, except for those of us who don't like doing laundry. But... Right, right. But you but imagine how much you wouldn't like doing laundry if it was a week long job, you know, that you had to do. Uh, it's like we, you know, I, we don't we, we've forgotten we've culturally forgotten how much of an absolute burden that was on half the population you know which half that was right but yes yes because you, yeah. you said people but i did make the note no no it wasn't people it was, it was women <laughs> <laughs> primarily just the women I, I i do remember and i was very very small uh hearing my grandmother complain about how she used to make starch on the yeah. stove 
Like that would I'm like, and, and I was like, what starch? Like, what are you talking about, old lady? What is yeah. going on? But we have um, a bunch of really, really what, uh, great questions. We have such a, um, a smart audience. And I want to jump in here. I do want to uh, do Tim Haywood's question first, because you were first, sir. Thank you. Um, do you think it's likely that renewable energy and grid storage will become a cheaper source of energy for the world compared to nuclear fusion once fusion becomes viable, rendering its development a moot point? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, so it's definitely a possibility. You know, uh, that's why, like I said, you you can't look at any technology in isolation. So you can't think, oh, by the time we get fusion, it's going to be awesome. And yeah, and by that time, solar power is going to be even more awesome than it is today. And battery storage is going to be even more awesome than it is today. It's a race among these various technologies. So then you could think, well, would there be different niches that they would fill? Because I don't, I think we also, this is another sort of, futurism fallacy, we think that there's we're going to be doing one best thing, like whatever is the best technology, that's what we're going to do. And when you think about your own life today, you we're still using materials that were used thousands of years ago. We're still doing things like when you cook, you know, you put stuff over flame, like we're still cooking largely the way people were cooking thousands of years ago, maybe even millions of years ago, you know, it's it's some technology is always this mix of future and past technology that we're, we're blending together. So you might think with fusion, even when we have, you know, really cheap solar and battery or wind, wind technology or whatever, is there still a use for it? It's like, well, yeah, there's lots of potential uses for it, I would think. And again, I mentioned some of them, you know, off world spaceships, and, but even on, even on, in for grid storage, there may be like, if you need a lot of power, you know, at the North Pole, you know, and not a lot of sunlight there for half the year, maybe an on-demand source might be better, you know, than than solar panels. And there, you know, if we, you know, uh, have ships under the sea, they might, you know, they, right now we use, few, we use fission power, you know, for, for our nuclear vessels, you know, if fusion ever becomes portable enough, maybe it might be applied to those sorts of things. If they still are around by the time we have it, who knows? So is, there's too many variables to to say. I think it's a technology that would be nice to have as an option. And what I would predict is that we're, we're going to have all of those things. They'll just have different purposes at, in different places. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Mike, thank you for this question. Should we be worried about what the, quote, worst authoritarian governments will do with the recent developments of AI? Absolutely. 100 percent you didn't um, even hesitate <laughs> yeah i mean okay. we have to be worried about ai in lots of ways and obviously we have a whole chapter on that in the, in the book both ro robotics then a separate one on ai and it's one of those things that's moving so fast is that our book is already obsolete you know by the time we, you know we we were done writing it and had to say okay we're done we can't write anymore no more updates to now the whole chat gpt thing happened since then you know, think about that. It's not, not that that's different than what we thought was going to happen eventually, but like we're in a really different place than where we were when the book went to, was published a year ago, less than a year ago, yeah. October. Uh, it's moving very, very quickly. Um, so with AI, yeah, there's a couple of uh, things in terms of like what could bad can happen from AI. I don't think that AI is going to take over the world. And I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of Cylons, you know, anymore. Okay. Um, for a lot of reasons, which we get into in the book. But what, what I think what experts are more concerned about is that powerful, narrow AI could have unintended consequences, even without the AI itself being sentient or, or wanting to cause problems because it can want to do something. But just because it's so powerful, you know, there could be these unintended consequences, you know, and it could do, th we can't really predict what it does. That's kind of the point. Like we can't, if we could totally predict what AI would do, we wouldn't need the AI, right? From one perspective. Um, the whole point is that it gives output that is is new and unique. It's not predictable. It's powerful. And, and there's the black box problem where we don't really know what's going on. Somewhere between input and output, there's some stuff happening that we don't know because we... It's too much for a human to track. 
And unless you really build in robust tracking mechanisms into the AI itself, which we're not doing now. Um, so there's lots of lots of potential risks that we really have to start to take seriously. And in the hands of someone unscrupulous, then, it, then everything gets magnified in order of magnitude. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's like any, these are tools and, you know, tools are powerful, but they could be used or misused or they could have, in, you know, un unintended consequences, accidents, et cetera. Um, we're, we're at a, we're at a, an interesting place, you know, with AI right now. Mm, indeed, indeed. Um, slight change uh, in terms of the, the conversation. Um, Catherine, I think this is a great question. Thank you for asking this. Um, what about medicine? In, in terms of future advancements, you know, thinking of some maybe portable diagnostic gadgets and, and we're not going to stray into Theranos here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do explore that in the book. We have a chapter, you know, on uh, portable uh, technology, uh, wearable technology. A lot of those applications would be medical. Uh, and there's a lot of potential there. There's a lot that we already have now that many people might not be aware of. You know, we basically already have a tricorder you know what I mean? We can make it pretty much a tricorder right now. I mean, maybe not everything that it could do, but pretty close. Um, you know, for example. So, uh, what are the what's like what tech, what would be necessary for that to happen? What would you know? What how close are we? How plausible is it? That's like one of the most plausible sci-fi technologies. Actually, I think is the tricorder. Um, and then we talk a lot about um, you know nanotechnology, about um, obviously stem cell technology, uh, and what what how they could potentially change the face of medicine and also genetics, genetic engineering. You know, we are taking control of our own code. You know what I mean? We, we of the biological code. And that's, again, when you combine sort of digital technology with genetics technology, with the ability to manipulate genetics, with AI, with nanotechnology, we're almost getting to the point you know, extrapolating this out into the future, we will likely get to the point where biology becomes digital. You know, our world is becoming increasingly digital. The physical world can become increasingly digital and biology can become increasingly digital, pro meaning like programmable, you know. Uh, so yeah, that's that's slowly happening more and more every day. And there, again, there's a tremendous potential for awesome things to happen and poten tremendous potential for abuse. This reminds me, and I cannot find the question, but it, it, it comes off what you just answered, um, that a lot of potential is there, but there are a lot of people for, shall we say, cultural reasons, religious reasons, are not so on the bandwagon yeah. for this. Um, would our, what will you do when folks are in a position to go, no, they want to, they want to go back to just fire. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I mean, there's always going to be, always going to be Luddites. There's always going to be people who you know, reject technology for various reasons, whether it's religious or ideological or lifestyle choice or whatever. And then I think a lot of people reject technology out of fear. Uh, some of it reasonable, some of it not reasonable, some of it, you know, again, manipulated or just irrational. Uh, what again? What we, I could tell you what has happened, and we could use that as a guide to what might happen. If you look at things like in vitro fertilization, go back to the the seventies of in, in vitro fertilization, and there was an uproar about making babies and what's this going to this going to have a population explosion and what will these these people will be under the microscope their whole lives and well, they won't be normal and blah blah blah. There's a lot of of you know, catastrophism and fear mongering around, around it. And now it's like nobody even bats an eye. It's right. Would you, would you deny someone the right to have children through in vitro fertilization? You know, it's, it's nothing. It's totally nothing. Then the same thing happened when we had like, remember the girl with the baboon heart and there was a big uproar about putting animal proteins in people. Well, it's, that's happening more and more already. And, and it's going to happen. So there are some technologies where I think like once you're, significant other is well, people that you love their live lives are saved by this technology i think the fears kind of wash away to a significant degree that's what that's what happens and we realize okay this is this is a good thing you know uh so uh but there's always going to be the the naysayers as well 
of course. I mean, humans, change isn't our best thing yeah. uh, for some of us. We, we go uh, kicking and screaming and, you know, it's all fine. If it all ends up on TikTok, everybody, we're going to be um, I know we're right at the hour, but I wanted to squeeze in one more question, if sure. I could, from Lee, who wanted to know, do the physical, uh, do physical laws set a limit on the future of humanity's ability to expand um, into the universe? Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that's, limits that, there. that is a good question that, that we address, which is what are, when you start to extrapolate things to their ultimate expression, which is what we do with technology. We're talking about the limits of physics, right? What's the ultimate limit mm -hmm. on imposed by the laws of physics on our ability to do computations, our ability to produce energy, our, our ability to travel through space. Uh, and, you know, like I, I, we come down pretty hard on the, the side of we're not going to ever travel faster than the speed of light. There's, right now, we... There's a couple of little places for wiggle room in the laws of physics where it might be possible, but you know the the smart money is on no. It's probably never going to happen. That's also probably why there are no aliens visiting us because it's really hard to travel interstellar distances. Maybe that's a good thing. You know, we we could debate about that. But there are, there are some things which we you know if we had to make our best guess now, you know that we probably. Are, are, there are there are these limitations but you know in a hundred years somebody might discover some subtle aspect of the universe that unifies laws and suddenly we realize oh it is possible by this mechanism that we didn't even know existed or to even ask about a hundred years ago so once you get past a certain point you know predicting the future is just it's a it's a guess it's chaos it becomes really really hard even the laws of physics become a well, this is what this is what we think is happening, but we're not really sure. Okay, I I mean I I really feel and maybe I don't have a lot of faith in humanity that we're just gonna bring it down to the big three, you know, like the common cold, baldness, and yeah. living forever, right? Because uh, who doesn't want that, right? <laughs> right. But but Steve, man, listen, thank you so much. This this really really was a treat uh, to to get to see you, you know, virtually and yeah yeah and yeah. Talk about the future. Uh, I really appreciate your time and your expertise. And I just want to let um, anyone know if you've tuned in late, uh, it, it's totally fine. If you missed any of this presentation, uh, it has been recorded and it will be available uh, tomorrow, I believe, for you to catch up and rewatch and share at skepticalinquirer.org. And uh, as always, uh, my thanks to Skeptical Inquirer, uh, the Center for Inquiry, uh, tonight's producer, Mike Powell. Uh, once again to you, Steve, thank you so much. And to everyone in the audience, thank you uh, for sharing your evening with us tonight. Uh, my name is Leanne Lord, and uh, thanks and good night. Steve, thanks. Have a really good night. My, my hellos to everyone in the novella tribe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs>